I'm Jody Shea, Chair of the School Board Finance Committee. Sean Babine is also here at the Town Council Finance Committee Chair. I have Christine Massengill and Carrie Lightford who are on the School Board Finance Committee. Um, Peter Hayes is here from the Town Council Finance Committee. It looks like Chris may be joining us right. later. Yep. Um, also George Entwistle, Superintendent, and Kate Bolton, the Finance Director, as well as Tom Hall, Town Manager, and Porter. And Joanne Sizemore, sorry Joanne. That's okay. <laughs> Can't miss her. <laughs> um, we'll go right into old business because we want to sort of get to our presentation. The status of our ongoing glossary development. We are very close, I was just saying. We're about five or six terms away. I won't point fingers as who I'm still waiting for. But um, if you can get those to me in the next, you know, four or five days. That would be appreciated, and then I will combine it all, send it back out, and then I think maybe at our next meeting we can sort of go through and highlight any that we think need further discussion. Now, I'm inclined to incorporate this in the budget document too, so to the extent it's helpful for us, the rest of it might be helpful too, so we'll yeah, find a way I, to incorporate the, the final draft. Yep, I think that's great, and I think also putting it on the uh, budget portal sure. would be great. And then 3B, report out on the budget forum 2016 planning. Who wants to sort of review what we've done? I'll, I'll it. No, I'll oh, defer, defer, it. I'll defer to Tom. Yeah, uh, generally, I think the, the group, and we checked in with the larger group last year as kind of the debrief. Everyone felt as though the format worked fairly well, so we're not looking to change things up dramatically. Uh, we will be taking questions uh, the day after the budget is presented, so we'll be ready through the budget portal to start taking questions on uh, <coughs> Thursday, April 7th, and we'll take them right up to the event. And the point of that exercise is really so we can make sure we understand the questions, make sure we can provide thorough and accurate answers uh, you know, at the time. And then, of course, we will be taking questions from the floor and doing our best to respond um, as we receive them. Kevin Freeman has graciously agreed to again moderate. Um, and again, the format won't change much. Uh, questions will be directed through George and I, depending on town or school subject matter. And to the extent we can't answer them, we'll draw upon our staffs, uh, who will be available in the front of the room. As I recall, that wasn't necessary all that often, but it's nice to have the comfort that um, they're there if we need them. Um, so again, that's April 27th, Wednesday, 7 to 8.30 is our plan mm -hmm. in the auditorium. And then I think after um, after that forum, we'll again post the Sorry. questions, um, not only the ones that came to us beforehand with <coughs> answers, but also the ones that came up um, sure. during that forum. Yeah, yeah in fact, uh, by tomorrow, I'll have last year's posted as well, just so that there, I suspect some of that territory will be familiar. I might as well put them up. Some of it. I Is think, uh, I'm not to interrupt you, Tom, but I think Colette and I did stick them up there um, but I'm not sure whether we did a save the date I can't recall now whether okay. we did a save we'll the date but we'll we probably should get a little bit more of a, a banner up there right. but I do recall that we were looking at it as she and I were trying to put things together up there so I did prepare kind of a to-do list and I think George and I will probably be able to tackle most of it mm -hmm. one of the open questions and I don't mean to put Jody or Sean on the spot last year there was a it was a letter to the editor or a yeah. leader article that promoted the event that might be a good idea. Mm -hmm. You two could collaborate on that sure. and try to get a place a couple weeks in advance of the event. I'll write it for you. <laughs> I appreciate that. But I think wow, I, just sign your name here. I think all the other logistics are pretty much in place, so George and I will be able to take care of all of that. So I did it with Chris, and look where he is now. It, late at the okay. end of the table. That's where I am. <laughs> Great, thank you, Tom. So moving on to new business, I think I'll, I'll turn it over to George mm -hmm. just to introduce our guests. Yes, we do have um, guests, and uh, they're from the Maine Education Policy Research Institute um, and uh, at, at the University of Southern Maine. We have um, Amy Johnson, she's co-director of the uh, institute, and uh, Jim Sloan is research associate at the institute. Um, they basically have done a brief study of school funding, expenditure, and academic performance in Scarborough, Maine, um, and comparable communities of York and 
Cumberland counties, um, and they're here to uh, do a presentation to the joint finance group in terms of their findings. So I don't know who's going to start off. Amy? Okay, I'll just say a couple words while we are passing out some of these handouts. Uh, yes, I'm Amy Johnson from the Maine Education Policy Research Institute. Um, where the Maine Education Policy Research Institute is actually co-located at USM and the University of Maine. So at USM, we're affiliated with an or another entity called CPAIR, the Center for Education Policy, Applied Research and Evaluation. So we go by both titles, which gets confusing sometimes, but we are at the University of Southern Maine. Um, so what Jim is passing out is some data that we've compiled and analyzed um, and a, a process that, that Jim will talk us through in just looking at some of the Scarborough expenditures. Um, a little bit of background about our organization. MEPRI is um, a, the policy institute that works with the Maine Department of Education on, on an annual basis to look at the essential programs and services funding formula and the funding model. So we have extensive history with understanding how the system works in Maine, um, looking annually at expenditure data. So that was, I think, how we came up on the radar for um, our qualifications to do this work. Go ahead, Jim. Sure. Jim has the floor. Okay, well, if you'll uh, open your reports, I think what we'll do is just sort of walk through uh, the information in the report. Um, the, as you can see on the table of contents, uh, the, we did the study in really three phases. The first phase was where we were um, determining a, a comparison group. So what we did is we were looking at the, uh, and, we'll, and we'll go through it all, but we, were, we needed to find comparable communities in North and Cumberland counties. And, um, then as part of that also look at looking at the academic um, performance in those communities to, to try to find maybe which of those within the comparison group were doing well, their students were doing well and might uh, be good examples, uh, sort of model uh, uh, school administrative units. And then uh, second phase of the study, we uh, looked at the education expenditures, the idea of investing in education and uh, uh, the third phase, we were looking about, you know, who pays for it uh, in terms of the state uh, contribution, the state subsidy, as well as uh, the local contributions. And now let's go through it. In. If you will turn to the first table, which is on page three. What we have here is a list of all of the school administrative units in York and Cumberland counties. And you can see, I'll just go across the columns. <coughs> uh, we were trying to find characteristics uh, that were important to school funding, that we know that have uh, some sort of relationship to funding. And so we looked at uh, resident enrollment because uh, sometimes districts that are very different in size are not, are not similar. Very small districts tend to have higher per pupil costs and so forth. So we wanted to find ones that were similar in size to Scarborough, as well as per pupil valuation, because uh, the per pupil valuation, and this is the state equalized valuation of uh, the town property. So this is your, the, the property tax base, um, because the property tax base per pupil um, is an indication of how of the, of the town's uh, resources in order to pay. And then the free and reduced lunch percent is a measure of poverty of the students and uh, has to do with student needs. And so what we try to find was uh, districts that were similar in all these, or not too, not too dissimilar uh, in all of these. So you can tell uh, we have a similarity rating. Uh, if they're identical, it's 100%. And as they get further and further away in either direction, uh, it goes down to, uh, you know, 0% would be uh, pro probably uh, very not comparable. Um, and if you look down the list, uh, it's in order of the overall similarity, which was just an average of the three similarity ratings in those, uh, in those. And to find schools that are dissimilar, if you look down the list, you might find some numbers in blue. Those are numbers that are kind of very different. Uh, you can see uh, Biddeford, for example, has very high free reduced lunch percent in comparison to Scarborough, so they maybe aren't the most comparable district. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look, there are more and more blue numbers as you get further down the page. Um, 
So, and, and I'll, I'll take questions at any time during the, during, and I'll also have some time afterwards, hopefully. But if you have, if you need any clarification, just, just let me. Um, so what we did to find the comparison group was we realized it was, it was all of the ones on here that don't have any blue numbers, that really none of the similarity uh, um, ratings are below 40%. And so if you look on page uh, four, you can see this is this sort of the same information, but it's a kind of graphically. And can I ask a question after we go? Yeah, you uh, can ask on this previous. Yeah, uh, yeah. So if I look at the overall similarity, it's telling if I read this correctly, it's telling me that they are all similar. Um, while the subsets of uh, whether it's free, reduced, lunch, or Per pupil, there are variances, but yet the overall group that's here, we're all we're similar with Westbrook, Portland, Kittery, Sam, uh, all of them, correct? I well, think I think that's say, a, yeah, it's somewhat um, subjective as what the percent means. I mean, what the the overall similarity is the average of each of the similarities. So this is just a, oh, a, an, okay. in, an index, if you will, to yep, try yep. to sort of so, sort it and see who was most yeah, similar coming up at the top. Yeah, and, and so overall, you can see uh, if you want to look at it. South Portland, Freeport, Kenny Bunk, the ones at the top of the list is sorted by the overall similarity. Those are more similar to Scarborough than okay. the ones at the bottom of the list. Yep, I appreciate That's, that. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And you said the cutoff was 40% or more? Uh, was, was what you determined as? Yes. I think we drew a line. Well, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I mean, it's really a two-step process. We sort of drew a line at around 60% in the overall similarity. And we're, we're working off that number. And then we realized that... Um, Biddeford had this number uh, previous lunch that was very dissimilar, and so we decided that was not a comparison school, uh, the school district. And then um, we looked at Gray, and even though Gray wasn't quite a 60% uh, overall similarity, um, none of its m numbers were below 40%, so we put that in, in, within into the comparison group. Great. Thank you. And that is reflected on. Uh, Following page, page four. Um, each district is, you know, each town or RSU is represented by a circle. Uh, the location of the circle on this uh, on this graph is based on free and reduced lunch percentage in the district and with the and the per pupil valuation. So the ones with um, higher poverty rates are toward the right side of the graph. The ones with lower are, are on, on the left side of the graph. The ones that are higher up have very high per pupil valuations. The ones at the bottom have lower per pupil valuations. And the size of the circle represents the, the district size, uh, enrollment size. And so you can see uh, the comparison school. Scarborough is a dark blue in the middle there. Um, you can see the comparison schools uh, in blue and a light gray are the schools that uh, were not comparable. And you can see why they weren't comparable if you look. The ones toward the right, the gray ones on the side, they just have much higher um, free and reduced lunch percentages, uh, much higher poverty. Uh, the ones toward the top, should be Island and Wells Oak Gunford, they just had very high um, per pupil valuations. A lot of fiscal capacity there. And then Dayton is also not on the list just because it's very small. The next uh, step that we took going on to page five. It's in, um, if you look at Dayton, Dayton's in one of the blue circles. It's like yeah, yeah, it's that they were overlapping. It's, yeah. It's on top of the world. Who's that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so on page five, um, now we started to look at the academic performance of all of these schools in the comparison group. And for the rest of the report, we're, we're not, we just, we're only looking at the comparison schools, the schools that were in blue. Um, and in fact, one of those comparison <coughs> schools is not on there is the uh, um, SACO because they were in uh, RSU 23. And so for most of the data that we have in comparing to the past, they, it wasn't available. So we, we left them out of the report. Um, 
So this you can see we have the uh, proficiency percentages um, in 2013-14 uh, uh, in reading and math in uh, on the, the state assessment in ECAP uh, and, the, and the main high school uh, MHSA main high school assessment um, grades five and eight in grade eleven um, and then I made an overall average score at the end and this is sorted this list is sorted by the the overall average of the uh, six uh, subject and grade levels that we looked at. So you'll see, and then Scarborough's at the top of the list, just so that you can see Scarborough clearly. But you can see all the ones with an uh, overall proficiency percentage above Scarborough or above that uh, bold line, the Falmouth, Cape Elizabeth, Yarmouth, York, and RSU 51. Um, that was uh, what we started referring to as an aspirational comparison group because those might be good schools to, to look at in terms of uh, schools that are doing a very good job in terms of their, just their uh, proficiency of their students. Uh, and um, then the, the group, uh, you know, Kenny Bunk, uh, you know, the RSU 21, RSU 35, and RSU 5, uh, those, those had, were fairly comparable, a little below how well Scarborough was doing with their students. Uh, but fairly comparable, and then and then the rest uh, is below the line. Um, and then at the bottom of the table, uh, as most of the tables after this in the, in the report will have these. Um, will have like a minimum, the lowest and the highest, and the mean of the different groups. The one, the comparison would be of all of them, including Scarborough and everybody else. And then the aspirational comparison group. When we look at that, we're just looking at the lowest and the highest and the uh, mean of those, um, just of those top five uh, school districts on the list. Any questions so far? Anyone's following this? So, so that, um, the, the bottom of the page, the aspirational group compare, comparison group? Mm -hmm. So we're at 77%, that's the overall percentage. Yes. The mean of that group is 83 Right? Yes, you're reading that right. So again, that aspirational group is just the five top districts, Agreed. the ones that have yeah. higher. And, and then and the, it, that will be the group that we're calling the aspirational group from here on out in the subsequent tables. Yes. So, okay. so, so if I can ask, uh, from an interpretation perspective, um, we are doing better than the mean, excuse me, we are not performing to the aspirational group. Yes. But we are performing better than the comparison group. Better than the mean of the whole comparison <coughs> yes. group. Is that yes. Okay. Yeah. Sure. And, in, in, and just based on our methodology, you, they aren't going to be doing better than the comparison, than the aspirational group because we define the aspirational group as those that were, whose students were scoring higher. Right. Okay. So, so I just want to be clear also that this aspirational group is solely based on performance, education performance. It has nothing to do with the economic side of things, with the cost side of things. Right. So that the whole right. comparison group were chosen based on the first couple slides as yep. being similar That's in right. ability Demographics, to pay, yep, right. yes, size. Okay. And this is purely so. academic performance. Right. Purely academic Perfect. performance. Thank and then, and then the rest of the report, what mm -hmm. we'll be doing is we will be comparing things like the financing and the funding. Yep. Um, of the comparison group and of the aspirational comparison group. If you look at grade 11, the score is really brought off for Scarborough compared to the aspirational group. Is that, is there any, those are just raw scores and it is what it is, or is there any? Well, it's, that is interesting, and I did, and I did notice that uh, going through them. That uh, if you do notice that uh, for the grade, especially in reading, grade five and grade eight, uh, right really track. Scarborough scores are within the range right of track. the aspirational yeah. group. Yeah. Um, it's grade 11, it drops off. Grade 11, it does drop off. So as they age, they get... Well, well, it's, it's, as, it's as, the, as history has dictated here at Scarborough, the least amount of investment has been made at the high school level. I think um, when we do our own little statistical comparison, and take a look at the top performing high schools um, of, of which the aspirational group is part, but there's also a few others 
um, in other parts mm -hmm. of the state. If you look at the other nine of the top 10 or the other 10 of the top 11, um, including Scarborough, on average, just a, as one indicator of resources at the high mm -hmm. school is the uh, student-teacher ratio. And the student-teacher ratio of the others, the average, um, if we were just at that average, we would have between 16 and 18 more full-time equivalent faculty members at our high school. So that gives you some sense as to what the high school is doing and the handicap that they have in terms of the resources that are missing. I just think that's a good, it's, it's a numbered interpretation of what we know the performance of the high school has been from the, I mean, you know, there's, it's, it's real data, it's not, it's not subjective, it's objective because it's based on test scores. So it's, it, it's the important thing for me would be it's more of a tangible measurement versus a we think this is happening or we feel this is happening kind of thing. And this phenomenon is equal, I mean, it happens in reading yeah. and math. So Correct. It's not just one or right. one. Correct. And it seems not as pronounced in math. Well, yeah, it, it, it seems that it's a statewide problem, not just a Scarborough mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. um, not, the I don't think so. not for the aspirational group. I think it's a Scarborough group. problem. <laughs> yeah. Aspirational group holds the role because it's, it's across. Um, it's the same for the peer. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 George, on that student teacher ratio, is that, is that true below the high school level as well? Do we have similar differences? No. Um, the, e uh, the easiest data to just pull out is really what's, um, what's collected in terms of the rankings mm -hmm. for high schools. So um, it, gets, it, it gets a lot more um, uh, mushy uh, at the lower levels because somebody might be an instructional strategist and somebody else might be a something else. And so in terms of how many teachers, I mean, you can do it. Um, I, I think that... Um, without looking at quantitative uh, indicators, I think that we are more comparable at those other grade levels. I think the easiest place to look is at the high school, which has really not changed in a long time. It's had a traditional schedule since 1990, which basically has locked in not only the resources, but allows no other opportunities. Um, so it's basically, we have created a static uh, uh, condition of resources to what's offered at the high school. And it's been locked in there since 1990. Um, anyway, I, it's, I, I think it's a dramatic um, indicator. And as Chris said, it's a quantitative indicator. You can run the numbers yourself on the top 10 or maybe even start looking at a broader group, but when they identify the top 10 performers in terms of high schools in Maine, um, one of the things that you look at is, well, how, how much do they have in terms of resources? And, um, and it's, a pretty, it's a pretty clear and clean apples to apples indicator to say that we are minus, I would say minus 18 full-time equivalent um, just to be at the same average as the others. So I guess my question for, for you guys would be how, how difficult or easy, and I guess to, to maybe to some staff as well, how difficult or easy would it be to track this on, a, on an annual basis? Is all the other test data for the other districts available through the DOE or is it? Yes. Yeah, it, it this, is. Is, this was all publicly available data. Okay. And in fact, this, the test scores in particular, are usually, are, you can find without too much difficulty on um, both the main data warehouse and the Department of Education's okay. website. So should we choose to use this as a metric to measure, it's easily updatable and it's it's easy to adapt from year to year or whatever span we choose? Yeah, yes. and in fact, it, on the on the warehouse itself, you can actually download a spreadsheet that would give you the whole state. You don't even have to go school by school and pick it out. Okay, thank you. And remember, you're looking at uh, percentages from 13, 14. And, and, uh, and then we've had some difficulty in terms of comparative data that would be available to us uh, because of the state. But, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm going to guess, um, were I to uh, ask to make a guess, I would say that it's probably not quite as dramatic uh, a change as if we were to look and had comparative data, but we would still, we would sh still show a lag 
as we hit high school. Uh, we would sh so show a, a bit of a precipitous uh, drop from the performance uh, K-8. So the next phase uh, was looking at the education expenditures. Um, and, I, and we were looking at two points of time. We were looking at uh, the 2011-2012 fiscal year, and then we're going to move forward to uh, the most recent fiscal year where we have comparable data for everybody, and that's the 2014-15. But uh, so on page six, you have the uh, education spending in 2012, and one thing that kind of jumps out is that the uh, overall um, Scarborough was on a was very very much toward the bottom in terms of spending, very low mm -hmm. spending on a per pupil basis in the total. Um, another. If you look at the uh, spending in instruction, uh, that was fairly low. It was in the you know it was below the mean of the of the entire group, and certainly below the uh, even the lowest of the aspirational group. Um, some of the other items of note uh, as you move across, I thought the student and staff support was pretty low. Uh, look very low in comparison to the other districts. System administration and school administration were, were both low. Is school administration even the lowest uh, of all the groups, of all of those school, uh, in, of all of the uh, comparison, comparison yeah. districts? And uh, you know, you can see that debt services was a little bit on the high side. But uh, then what I did, what we did for um, Page seven, we look at the changes <coughs> that were made in, in spending in all of the districts. So this is the, the change. This is a question on debt service. So I'm just curious for those projects that receive state funding. This, I'm sorry, are they is, reported there as well, or is that locally funded? Sorry, this is local only uh, local debt service. Only. Yeah. So if it, so for example, if the if it was a state approved school and state funded school construction project, that would not on here. Thank you. So, so it was Wentworth would be in this number, not the yes, yeah. It would be. Yeah. It would be at this point, it would have been? Uh, uh, not in 12, no. 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 Right, so it's not. No. Not this so number. It's not. Be I mean, it would be in that number, but it's not in this Correct. analysis. Yeah. So I, I, then just a quick question. I think it occurred to me, um, using the normal reporting, I don't think Yarmouth includes their debt payments in their educational spending. How did you accommodate for Different towns reporting different differently. Uh, you mean that they would do a, on the, in the town? And I think I, I, my understanding is they incorporate that into their overall <coughs> debt structure and remove that from the tap the school funding portion of it. So how would you differentiate? I I, I, that, I don't know if that's entirely accurate, or not, but that was kind of my interpretation looking through their spreadsheets. In in this report, it, do, it, it doesn't. So okay. this report is is merely what is reported to the. Department of Education, State okay. Department of Education, and then the department uh, reports out in these reports. So this is gotcha. all publicly available from yep. the Department of Education. Gotcha. That, that's a local way that they do reporting. It must okay. Go. If you look at the number, they're not so far out of whack. They're very yeah. comparable to the aspirational group. But they don't have a lot of latitude in how they're allowed to report their expenditures to the state. There is a sort of a standard chart of accounts they have to use for that. Right. I mean, there may be areas where they have data collection issues, but by and large, it's it's been in place for long yeah. enough. It's okay. usually pretty good. And, and I have to say that I, I do want to say that the financial data that is reported out by the state you know, has has improved over the years with the new with the not not new anymore, but the even going back before the Medem system was put in and. They had an old chart of accounts, and there were these differences uh, in the accounting, the local accounting, um, and that that was much more reflected in the data before. So the, the data is much improved over what it's been in, in prior years. So, so, so it is, is pretty it, comparable. It is so it is fair to say that this is really a true kind of apples to apples. Long time, there's not a whole lot of interpretation of what columns go where. This is DOE reported, how they report it, and hard numbers. Yes, that, that, that for the most part. I mean, so, some in some cases, this, for example, school administration and system administration. If you have certain tasks that are done by a principal in one place and done by an assistant superintendent in another, that it's supposed to be reported based on the function that they're. But a, a lot of times, it, it does get reported based on the person that's doing the job. Okay. Uh, and so there are there are things like that. So 
one caveat is if you're looking at system or school administration, you should probably look at both because those are examples where you might uh, have some of the functions in one district reported in one and mm -hmm. other, in the other. Just a real quick question. Have you, and, and maybe it's further before I look ahead, but have you guys ever done any sort of a coefficient relationship between, is there, is there a statistically valid relationship between expenditures per pupil and actual academic performance? I've read things that say there is. I've read things that say not so much. Is that in here? Is there anything that you've done to look at this expenditure by the peer group or the it's definitely not in here. Start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a big debate in in uh, in the academic literature. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've read both sides of the um, equation, and it seems to be where I stand on it is if you if you simply are looking at more money, differential effects of more money, just generically speaking. <laughs> often you will not find any systematic differences. You will find systematic differences because maybe rich schools spend more and maybe their schools do better. But once you correct for this, this, the, the students, once you equalize the student populations, um, differential spending in itself alone, there is not a lot of explanatory power. However, I would add to that that there are some things that you can do that cost money that that can um, make a difference. And so I, I believe, in my opinion, money, in my judgment, money that is spent well, additional money can make a difference. Has but any, sometimes has, money is not spent well. Right, and so has there been any work? Have you guys done any work? Are you gonna do any work on, and, and I think I agree with you, it's how you spend the money. But have you guys done some analysis that shows what those things are that you spend money on? Is it, is it yes. as we had talked about, is it teacher <laughs> size? Is it, I mean, classroom yeah. size? So that would be really helpful at some point if you have that data to say, where, if you have money, well, where so what, should it go to get the biggest One of the bag? things that we did was uh, our, our center has done a, um, a fair amount of work on what we've identified as high-performing schools. Yeah. And so this is a way of looking at all the schools in the state and basically saying, who, who could we find that are schools that are, quote, unquote, beating the odds? Yeah. It's a line of research that's been done nationally, and we re-replicated it here in Maine with some yeah. support from the, the Maine legislature, so our tax payer dollars at work. Uh, we had a two-year study where we sent out teams of researchers into the field to conduct case studies and actually look at some of these schools that were popping out in the data as being um, spending their money well, efficient, not, not spending four times above the state average, but um, getting more bang for their buck in terms of... Yeah getting good, good outcomes for their investment. And so we went then and then conducted case studies to say, what are the things that matter? And then we have a whole series of reports on our website, and it's probably well out of the scope of today's conversation to get too much into that. But absolutely, um, it, there are certain investments that matter. There are certain investments that don't. And that might be something we could come back and talk about at a future time, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. we, bring, I, we could bring some of the researchers who participated in those case studies, if that's of interest. I also want to caution us, though. Um, that's more of a school board function than a town council function. Um, while I think it's good to ask those questions, I, I don't think it's within our purview as council members to say we <coughs> should invest in X or Y. I, I mean, I think we can have those discussions, but ultimately, that's I think that's the board's prerogative to decide where they think the investments should be best applied. I, I'm not saying that we don't ask those questions, so that's part of our discussion to determine if the funding's correct, but I'd be very hesitant to look at one investment program versus another investment program um, from from what the board's presenting to us. And I think, what, I, th I think what is indisputable is the correlation between the quality of who is in the classroom and what they are doing in the classroom and student outcomes. As, uh, the one thing I was going to say is there was no easy answer about the one thing that matters is class size. Or the one thing, there were no easy black and white. Yeah. It was things like setting high expectations, mm -hmm. teacher quality, how time is spent, how efficiently time is spent, good leadership, things that um, don't culture. actually, right. culture, yeah. Um, yeah. Use of time. And, and I think our, from our, again, from our purview and perspective, I think we can ask what kind of outcomes we're going to expect and what kind of improvements we're going to expect for the investments that we're going to be making. Um, that would be to be, to me, that would be a, a, an easier conversation for us to have of if we're going to choose this parameter of high school math equivalency scores, what kind of 
proof improvement can we expect if we make this kind of investment rather than saying you know maybe we should look at investing in more teachers or investing in you, you know what I mean I, I think we can that's how we would that's how I would think we would as a council would manage the department and say okay show us your performance show us where the where the improvements are going to be if that makes sense um you turn to page seven additional uh, spending in all the districts was higher um, in 2015 than in 2012 and this one is simply the additional money uh, that was spent the change the change in um, education expenditure by category and uh, wanted to point out in the case of Scarborough if you look across the top that the bulk of the money the largest portion of it was certainly instruction, and the largest portion was uh, regular instruction. Um, and going across, looking, additional amounts were added to system administration and school administration and, uh, and others. Uh, debt service was a fairly large uh, increase if you look at uh, comparing to other uh, districts. Uh, some districts, it looks like Falmouth, that, you know, must have had a construction project. Um, you can sort of tell those things. Um, this time but so so Wentworth would be in this number. Right. If it picks up through 2014, 15. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So if, if, again, from an interpretation standpoint, this is it safe to say that this means Scarborough is making more investments in education from 2012 to 2015 than the other districts. Because that's why our number is 2890. Yes. So we are making more investments recently. Recently. Right. Yeah, th yes. that, what this, yes. so again, page six was sort of showing some fairly low per people spending in comparison yes. yeah. to the comparison group. And this shows, this is the change on this yep. slide, which is the, the amount that's been added since 2012. So the amount that's been added is, is, is larger than uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty significant. Yeah, it's significant. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The aspirational group, the mean was 1,800, and we spent 2,900. So and remember, that's, right. well, 2.9. Yeah, remember, they started higher. Right. Yeah. So right. we're catching Barbara up. Barbara Rod added, yeah. added more. And, and you know, we'll see in the next day, you will see how they're sort of catching up to put them in. Moving right. them and I think the important thing to mention, too, though, is remember their, their, their performance outcomes are better as well. So I think... Where, where, hmm. while I, I'm not, I, I want to be careful. We don't just correlate. We're, we're spending more money, so we're doing okay. I think ultimately the goal is the performance measurements, the outcome, the student outcomes. It's also well, where you're spending it, right? Well, right. Well, that's that's the other discussion, oh, well, that's of course. Conversation. Right. That's and, I, and I think this previous slide shows that these um, aspirational comparison groups have been investing over time. Right. Whereas, yes. On right. that previous slide, it shows that Scarborough frankly, hadn't. Right. And so to then come to this 2014-15, it shows that Scarborough finally got on board and said, hey, it is important for us to invest. Meanwhile, these ones have already been investing all along and don't need the the push to... Right. I just want to make sure we're, we're focusing on the ultimate goal is, is not necessarily... I mean, the, the investment piece is important, but the ultimate goal is the performance-based side of it. And I, I want to make sure we don't get sidetracked with, well, we're investing a lot of extra money now in education. We should be okay. Um, I, I, don't, I don't want that conclusion to, I, I don't saw that, draw that conclusion. Yes, we've invested more over that gap, but we had a, to, I think to your point, we had a bigger gap to make up. And the other, the other piece is just, you know, just from the way that systems, particularly school systems work, is investments are made. They don't necessarily create a reaction at the end of that school year. The investments, you know, um, I'm pleased to see this because I think what the team, my team and I have continued to say is where we have made investments, there have been changes. And I think that I've peeked ahead here and I think that there's something in here that might speak to that as well. So. Yes. 
But it's <laughs> uh, before we get there. <laughs> you, before we you would blame me for not being a little ahead of uh, you all. Do you eat your dessert first, George? What? Do you eat your dessert first? Life is short. We can never, never was left. We can stay on the one last point on for just a little bit, and and I just I want to really look at again look at regular instruction. In special ed instruction is, is important too. It's 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 often it's less um, up to uh, decisions. It's, it's more required sometimes. But the regular instruction, um, you can see it's still below the aspirational group, but it's m more t around the mean of the total group. Mm -hmm. uh, system administration and school administration are ones that a lot of people are very concerned about um, about not overspending in those. And and if you look. It does not look like Scarborough was overspending in the, the, the fiscal year 15. It was, uh, again, school administration was the lowest of the group, still the lowest, even though they had to put some in investment in there. Um, system administration is on the low side. Um, and uh, then we can, I think we can, and then the total spending, you look at that as well, and it's still below the aspirational group in terms of the, the, you know, the, the ones that are performing. Uh, well, academically, and then, but more toward the mean of the comparison group. And then we can look, one of the things was, if you're thinking about as an investment, this might be some idea of some early uh, returns. Uh, obviously, education is a long process of, you know, 13 years or so uh, you're putting into each student. But, uh, so a two-year change in proficiency rates is what we're looking at on page nine. Um, it's not a perfect measure, and, and uh, but it's just one indication of uh, that things might be going well. In that, if you look at the Scarborough's overall change, you know it's a two percent increase, and compared to the mm. comparison group, you know that's that's really good. Um, so it's a good, it's a good indication. Again, it's just one one year, one difference. A one two year difference, one point one point in time, uh, from six different subjects and grade spans. So that helps, but it's still one point in time. But it's an, it's an indicator. I don't know what York's doing in grade five. They had some big, big <laughs> some, well, I, yes, I I noticed that one. Uh, it, it, it's fairly small number of students there, and uh, you know it went from maybe seven to ninety one. Yeah. 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 This, this page definitely does need a standard but disclaimer about it's a few about the we're comparing two different cohorts of data. We don't want to go on record as saying that increased investment caused your two percent. We need to be a little bit more tentative about this data. We're dealing yeah. with a two-year gap in time, but this is just. One of those things you want to look at to see if things are trending in the right direction, and it looks like things are trending mm -hmm. in the right direction for Scarborough. Mm -hmm. I love this there were slide. Some, there were some twins that moved down. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> <laughs> they left Scarborough. Yeah. But we still right. Okay. If we're ready to move on to phase three. The, now, now, how do you pay for all of that? <laughs> so that's. You have okay. A I know. <laughs> State and local contributions. To education funding and what this first slide is here it's really just a uh, kind of a listing of characteristics that show things that might affect the, the resource needs of the students as well as uh, the ability to pay of the community um, if you look at the free and reduced lunch percentages you can see that uh, Scarborough is right toward the bottom of the aspirational mm -hmm. group um, but it's, uh, uh, you know, it's sort of rather the top, you know, m a, little, a little more poverty than most of the aspirational group, uh, but lower poverty than most of the other schools. Um, the regional salary index is, uh, is the, in it's the adjustment that they, that the state uses in uh, determining what salaries should cost in a district based on uh, economic data, based on uh, uh, local data, labor market areas, the salaries of other districts in, labor, in the labor markets. And uh, so you can see most of them are the same because they're in the same labor market or nearby labor markets. But it's an indication of uh, some districts, because of competition, do need to pay their teachers more than other districts. And then the, the per pupil EPS model amount uh, that's that's the number off the off the 279, as they say, that they're using, that the state determines 
<clears throat> how much total money, local and state money, it should cost to meet the main learning results. Um, and a lot goes into that number. The regional salary index goes into that number. There's a, a weighted pupil counts for the number of students on uh, eligible for free and reduced lunch. Um, there's uh, a whole special ed model that goes into it, depending on this, the number and severity of uh, special ed uh, disability students. Um, and uh, it's a, a sort of an overall um, measure of district needs based on the student needs and based on the resource prices and, and, and so forth. Um, then on the right side of the line, you see median household income and per pupil valuation. And those are on there to show fiscal capacity. Of course, the per pupil valuation is a good indicator of the tax base and, and how well you can use the tax base to um, get extra money for education in terms of uh, providing resources on a per pupil basis. Um, but the median household income is the, in there because, of course, people have to pay their taxes out of their income. That you can have communities that have high property wealth with lower incomes and or in versa. and so both are very important. And uh, you can see <coughs> where Scarborough falls in terms of median household income, um, generally below most of the aspirational group, uh, but. Uh, a little, a little above, about right, about at the mean of the whole group. And in terms of per pupil valuation, they're also, um, in this case, they are kind of in the middle, but also in the middle of the aspirational group. In, in terms of the aspirational group, does not necessarily have higher per pupil valuations. And uh, one thing to remember is this does include um, commercial property. It could include uh, second homes and things like that. It's not just residential property in the, in the valuation, and that's why some uh, districts have a different um, valuation than, than some people might expect when they first look at it. Yes. <coughs> so, so I'm sorry, could you just uh, help me understand this regional salary yeah. index again? So the lower the number, the, the, the more, uh, the, the less costly your labor is? Or? Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. And Thank therefore, the, the lower the, um, the amount in the EPS formula that the state would say you need to raise gotcha. for your minimum budget. Yeah. Just a quick question. I mean, if you take a look at the aspirational group and you look at the EPS model and what it says it should cost, and then you go back to page eight where all the aspirational groups are spending significantly more than the model. Is there a problem with the model? Is it? Is well, it no. What, what happens in the, with the model is with with the EPS model, so that amount, the EPS total amount, what the state then does is they determine the local ability to pay. And that local ability to pay becomes the local required share, let's call it. Uh, so that's what, the, that's, what, that's the problem with the formula. They the determine index. what your ability yeah. to pay is. And they take that's why the, it bumps it up. The, yeah. That's why the total expenditure <coughs> bumps up. Exactly. And, what, and so what happens is then the rest of it that's not the local required share is the state subsidy. Now, on top of all of that, on top of the EPS amount, there can be a local optional spend expenditure. So the locals can raise more bills than the state requires, and in fact they do, and uh, therefore spend uh, more money than mm -hmm. the EPS. And, and e the EPS model amount is supposed to be the amount to meet the learning results, and it doesn't include much in the way of, for example, extracurriculars. Um, it includes co-curriculars, but not so much in the way of extracurriculars and some uh, other um, uh, items that might be in a comprehensive program uh, that uh, districts uh, will want to have. Are, are you aware of any districts that are only funding to the EPS level? There are a handful. The, the one that makes the news most often is Lewiston. Okay. Um, and it's something I think that's an annual struggle mm -hmm. for some districts. You guys may relate to this. sometimes the challenge of getting a budget passed by taxpayers. But one, one of the things that I think is perhaps not widely discussed is the fact back in the initial days when the EPS formula was being developed, it was widely discussed as being a floor and not a ceiling. And this is the minimum we want you to raise. Um, and a lot of that has been sort of lost along the way, and I think a lot of communities see it as the maximum budget. 
it was never intended to be the maximum budget. It was intended to be a, the minimum that you must raise to at least get a comprehensive education, a, a comprehensive curriculum in the schools. It doesn't, for example, even account for m perhaps wanting AP courses. AP courses would be something that they would say is on the top gravy. And I think many communities would not necessarily see that as uh, optional. They would see that as something core to what they do. So all those kind of things that communities might want to bring in to even enrich the curriculum further would be things that they would spend out of, out of their own additional. Right. Actually, uh, Chris, I would, would add like to the, 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 I'm sorry, so the fewer the fewer and fewer districts uh, are spending below, at or below the required amount. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, actually, Chris, if you just look at page 10 and page 8, a lot of those schools that are in the comparison group but in the lower tiers, Gore and Brunswick, if you look at their EPS and then you look at what they're actually spending, it's more closely aligned than, than the exceptional group. So there's some that are pretty, you know, pretty well matched. Yep. Others are not, but just interesting. And we have a little bit of analysis further on in the slides and talk a little bit about that optional fund spending. Yep. The state contribution, and here's, and this, oh, here's is, actually, this is our slide. This is, this is the slide. Yeah, this is the slide. So we have, and here's what we have in terms of the total expenditure as a percentage of EPS amount. I want to talk about that a little bit. So you can see that Scarborough, the amount was 106% in 2012 and 123% in 2015. But what that percentage is, is the um, percentage of the essential programs and services. So you can see they were 6% above essential programs and services in uh, 2012 and uh, which compared to all the other groups was mm -hmm. was was very low uh, not the lowest but certainly well below anyone in the aspirational group uh, and below the well below the mean of the entire comparison group mm -hmm. and you can see that two of the districts were uh, actually slightly below uh, EPS but in 2015 all groups are above EPS uh, in the comparison group, um, and uh, Scarborough seems to be uh, about at the mean of the comparison group and almost up to the lowest of the uh, aspirational comparison group. Um, <coughs> and so part of what goes, you know, to funding that is the state subsidy as a percentage of essential programs mm -hmm. and services. And one of the things that's notable in that as you can see that it has gone down from 2012 to 2015, whereas most of the other groups, uh, it's gone up, the, the percentage it, it has gone up. Um, but you can tell that uh, with Scarborough, it has gone down a bit. And to explain maybe why that might happen, uh, put the last two columns on here, which is a, ch a change in valuation, um, because this valuation is what the state uses to determine the local ability to pay and the change in enrollment because uh, the EPS amount is very much dependent on enrollment because so most of the spending is on a per pupil basis or the, uh, the teacher recommended teacher ratios are based on student enrollment and uh, many other per pupil amounts. So uh, you can see that the valuation uh, went down but not by as much as most of the other districts. What's the source of, on the change in valuation, that seems um, <clears throat> questionable only, um, I don't believe I've ever seen our valuation in our budget ever go down. Well, what, what happened here, this is, now these are um, based on the, the, for the valuation that's used for the funding year in 2012 and 2015, and so the, it's a, there's a lag, so that there's a lag of, of a few years, so really the, the 2012 it's funding year, valuation used in the 2012 funding year is, is an average of uh, valuations through 2009. And what happened from 2009 to around 2012 was a decrease in some population. Yeah, that, make, that, that, so that makes sense. Then, yeah. This is also the, the statewide <coughs> equalized valuation, yeah. which may be different than what you might s right. see on your bill. So, so one of the things that I think is challenging for us as Scarborough is to try and figure out which factors are the biggest ones because even looking at your aspirational group here, we continue to seem to be on the lower end of the receiving pool. Um, would you say that pupil per pupil or, or, or excuse me, uh, change in enrollment is a larger factor in determining that versus change of valuation, or is it really difficult to determine that based on the complexity of the formula? 
It is hard to determine because the valuations are changing all over the state. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's your change in valuation relative to how everybody else is changing. Okay. Um, but change of enrollment is a little, it's a little easier because it's more of a proportional thing in terms of the uh, state funding. <coughs> is that even realistic to ask the question? I mean, it's interesting to know, but what does that mean? We're going to recruit kids? Yeah. No, 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 because I think that what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to What can we do about it? No, what I'm trying to determine is, is obviously people are asking questions of why does our state funding keep getting cut? And, and the responses that we keep getting is, well, our, it's, of our, it's our valuation, or yes, it's our student count, or yes, it's a combination of all those things. I just want to make sure that we have a clear understanding because, as you know, no matter, it depends on who you ask and how you ask that question. So it, it wasn't necessarily a rhetorical question. It was to try and understand if there is a a better explanation as to why our funding continues to be cut more so than the aspirational group. What are we doing differently or, or better or worse than those other towns are doing that's causing us to have a, a, a yeah. improper or in, inappropriate, in, in disproportional reduction so in our So important to understand to help explain. Correct. I'm just not sure if we can affect those there. No, 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 I'm not saying that. I, I, it's more of an explanation standpoint because what I, what I want to avoid is having somebody say, well, it's just a matter of, of, of uh, if it's enrollment, then, you know, do we start building, try and tie that into, are we building the right developments in town or something along those lines. Yeah, so, some policy things <coughs> right, that right. Right. It, it appears as though, if you just sort of look at it anecdotally, that if you have a decrease in your student population, that's one strike against you. If you have an increase in valuation, that's another strike against you. But if you have both, that's four strikes against you. <laughs> and that's a count. Oh, exponentially one strike, No, one strike is four. <laughs> or maybe three strikes. <laughs> Or that's the way the formula appears to work. Right. I know it's a lot more complex than that, but it's just trying to find a simple, boiled down explanation as to why we seem to continue to be the biggest reducer across the state on a regular basis. It seems, it seems like that we need to reduce the increase in our valuation and increase the number of students in our school. Well, I would, but it's also, no. you know, people, <laughs> people, I'm serious. Look at the number. People talk look a lot Yerman. about the drop in enrollment and <clears throat> look at it from one year. And, and all this. A drop of 60 kids in a year doesn't affect how the school department does business. Right. It just doesn't. It's, it, it's one kid in one kindergarten class at Blue Point School. It's one kid at Pleasant Hill. And for, there's, it's pockets of things. It's not like, oh, well, we have 60 less kids. If there's 14 students per teacher, we can get rid of four teachers. It just, it doesn't work that way. It's, they're not products. Yeah. It's scattered among six well, schools and 12 grades. If anything, the data grade. says that it's a pattern of behavior. It, it takes time to impact the numbers, right? Yeah, but I also like you said, it's not, one, it's not one, year to, one year to the next year. It's about three-year averages and three-year patterns that go into that. More importantly, it's relative, though. Yeah. Right, because if we're, I mean, everybody seems to be experiencing some kind of enrollment reduction across the state. If you just look at total numbers from one year to the next statewide, it's down. So, yeah. so if it's proportion, if it's proportional, if it's a proportional evaluation, it's it, you know we're not going to Tom's point. It's not like we're going to be able to bring more kids in. It's a question of are we losing students at a much more rapid rate than another town is. And are we gaining valuation or maintaining what I, we were told was you're maintaining valuation, which is better than losing it, which is what most communities are doing. So that's a relative term. It's not like we're getting penalized for improving. We're just getting penalized compared to everybody else. And, and that's, that's what, to me, that's the, that's the intangible. That's, hard, that's a hard thing to predict and a hard thing to plan for because you just don't know without doing some very detailed analysis on a, day, on a yearly basis where we're going to end up from year to year. So that, and that then gets us to our argument of how quickly or do we want to get to minimal receivership exactly. and how quickly do we want to do that. Because exactly. that takes that volatility out of our planning and our budget. And we're so close. It's, right. really, it's really one and a half steps away. Right. I think the final slide really is, one true. Of, in my mind, is one of the biggest differences from Scott and Scott and Scott and Scott and No way. Because our value is so much greater than others. Yeah. The value of a mill to us is two and three and four times greater than others. Yeah, right. Yeah, and 
So if you look at uh, yeah, uh, slide 12. Okay. Um, so you can see one of the things that is on the local required <coughs> contribution, you can tell that for most, it's the same. That's the statewide required bill rate. Um, for others, work, for example, and I don't know if you noticed on a slide a few slides back that uh, York has a very high valuation per pupil. And that's why they're a minimum receiver, which means they don't have to raise up to the required mill rate in order to fully fund their schools. Mm -hmm. So that's why their required rate is uh, lower than the, than the state uh, required mill rate. Um, and then, but then, uh, yeah, on the local option, additional mills raised, you can see that uh, you know York does does do a high amount. All of the aspirational schools did a pretty high amount, even back in uh, 2012. Um, and uh, Scarborough was on the low side, and, and Scarborough uh, in 2015 uh, was not as not as low. They were still in the bottom. Uh, you know, they're still below the mean of the entire group, and uh, certainly would be toward the bottom of the aspirational group as well. But this is where. Uh, you know, Scarborough was, you know, the most recent comparison year um, in terms of uh, the, the tax effort uh, toward education. Is York like the only minimum receiver in the state, or are there others? Oh, no, There's there a number. Others. Handful? More than a handful? Oh, I think it's more than a handful. I'd say 50. Uh, well, so well, dealing with SAUs, yeah. right. if we um, count the ones who are receiving 30% of their special ed costs, because that's higher than what it would be, then there's there's a it's a good handful, really? and again yeah. that's um, that's dealing with uh, you could have mo an LE there's about there's over 200 LEAs because even though we don't really think of that many districts, some of those LEAs don't even operate schools. Yeah. So in that number, especially dealing with some of these very small communities that don't even operate schools and they tuition out, we have quite a number of minimum receivers. Yeah, maybe a rural district that has a lot of a uh, lot of property, not many students, and they just send the tuition. Um, and that's definitely a case where you have a minimum receiver, but it's not somebody that you would have heard of, or it's not somebody that you say, oh, they're a very rich district. But there are minimum receivers uh, all over the state. But both in our comparison group, it, there's only one comparison. In no, like Freeport, anybody no, in 2015 say, that's yeah. under 8.1 yeah. is a minimum receiver. Yeah. So this there's a, there can be some very strange really? things with the RSUs in that you can have certain towns inside that are minimum receivers. Uh, oh. it's, it gets very yeah. complicated. So Raymond so might be a minimum receiver yeah. where Wyndham is not, and overall the RSU comes. Yeah, yeah. yeah there are some it. other like some other things with the yeah. RSUs, but generally that's what it is. Was there um, a significant or noticeable impact on EPS formula from charter schools? Now that they've they're taking it out of the whole pie up front instead of because they have no valuation, they're getting the full pupil reimbursement rate, correct? Um, in terms of impact on EPS, what it what I think that did is so at, so everybody's EPS gets calculated, and there's this big dollar sign that says this is EPS for the whole state, yep. and then the state says we're going to fund X percent of that, and they, that dollar amount gets set, yep. and then the charter schools come off the top of that. Okay. And the rest comes out in subsidy, and so this. So here's here's EPS. Uh, here's funding, funding that's going to happen. That determines the mill rate. Yeah. If these charter schools weren't here and they were coming down here out of tuition, the mill rate might have been down a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, this the the mill rate gets set at a point where it has to account for all those charter schools being in that state share percentage. But their mill rate. How do you calculate their mill rate they, if they, they don't, don't have an asset? You know what I mean? they don't right, they don't it. have it. Right, exactly. Yeah. So they're coming off the top of that state share percentage, and therefore um, the, the the amount that's left to go, go sure. to the other district. It, it's not a, it's not affecting EPS. Right. It's what it's affecting, affecting is the amount of state. EPS. Right. Yeah. The amount of state aid that's available after that mill rate has been established. Okay. So do you can you, do you I mean just roughly is that two percent three percent is there is it a significant amount is it something that's really not measurable or uh, the total that's a good question I mean off the top of my head I want to throw out. Like ten million, but that's completely off top of my million. Yeah, fourteen total out of the EPS budget of over total EPS is around two billion. Two billion with a B. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's really not even on the. It's not yet. Really that was in fact why they did that was to try to right. even it out that right. across yeah. Yeah. all yeah. districts. Of course, of course. Okay. But again, just to just to take that analogy a little bit further, so once the state sets that mill rate, 
the amount of money that Scarborough has to raise is determined by that mill rate. Before you even have a single kid enrolling in school, it's not at all proportional. It says you must raise this amount. And then for every kid that you add on, the EPS formula grows. And so you're somewhere up here. And so when you were talking before about what's affecting everything, you're, when your valuation changes relative to other people, that, that changes how much this bar hurts you on the mill rate. When your enrollment drops, that, the amount that you're above, your EPS is above how much you have to raise, for every dollar that, that comes out, that's coming dollar for dollar out of your state subsidy. Do, does that make sense? It's not proportional. Like when we look at this 14%, you don't lose 14% of those kids. You, for every dollar out of EPS that you come down, until you are right here as a, as a minimum receiver with your, that the amount raised being your mill rate, um, that's all coming straight out of your subsidy. And that is where I think you're at where you're seeing this sort of pain and this subsidy that's dropping, is it is impacted by your valuation and the yeah. enrollments for both. Fascinating. Does anyone else have any questions? Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They, they, um, um, Jim and Amy will actually be putting together uh, a, a little bit more of a narrative. On yeah, this. we could do a, a brief narrative sort of touching <coughs> on some of these to, highlights. To be able to point out some of the interesting uh, factors. And um, once that's completed, then I think that it can be. Um, Certainly, it will be part of probably part of the uh, an exhibit to the budget, perhaps. Um, I know it will certainly be on the um, the website for the school, so it would be accessible to people. Uh, if anybody's listening, trying to figure out what we're talking about, it's very difficult without seeing the the charts here. Yeah, so. right. And again, and that that narrative that we'll be adding in is the narrative that we just gave you. That exactly. We'll be codifying right. <coughs> Perfect. Perfect. And I would suspect that for the board. Um, that the, um, uh, the Institute would be a good resource in terms of going forward with this as a basis and then really looking at the kinds of, of changes that are happening both in terms of spending and in terms of student um, outcomes. Uh, and it's been a pleasure really uh, working uh, with these folks. Thank you. You've done a great job. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So why don't we take a two-minute break? We'll let people regroup. And yeah, and before you go, I'm just going to distribute a piece that I'm going to speak to after. If you want to take a few minutes just to uh, maybe review it before we get going, and I should just help them understand it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, we are back from a quick break. Um, we just have a couple more things before we wrap up. Continuing on with new business, B, planning to address subsidy gap. And I will turn this over to Tom. Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, the tail end of the previous discussion, I think, was a great hint or, or segue into this conversation. Um, we've known for some time that state, state subsidy has been decreasing. We're starting to better understand what variables affect that. But the phenomenon is real. And we've never been closer. In fact, I think there's more clarity than ever in terms of when we might reach that magical minimum receiver status. And some suggest that it could be as soon as fiscal year 18. Um, I don't think that's unrealistic. You know, it could be two or three years out. But nonetheless, it's sooner than later for sure. What we do know for sure, this year we've got a million dollar funding gap to deal with. And at the last meeting of this group, I hinted at the potential opportunities we have to help bridge some of that gap. And I'd like to, what I distributed is a proposal to use some of these uh, remaining project funds for the wet work project to help us make that transition. Uh, first and foremost in fiscal year 17, and then this proposal also provides some opportunity in the out years. When we use it, how much we use it, I think is a discussion for a different day when we know better what the landscape is. Um, I might be naive, but it's possible that there could be more funding toward education in the next biennium. Um, there's a ballot measure before the voters to provide 55% of funding and a fiscal uh, note associated in terms of how to make that happen. So. It's possible, the trend suggests that that might be improbable, but it's possible. So this time next year, we'll have a better sense of where we stand. Um, so let me just introduce kind of uh, in a broad brush in terms of uh, what the opportunity is. In 2015, we made the final payment or payments to the Wetwood project. That was a project that uh, was about $36, $36 million in total cost. It spanned over, I think, three different fiscal years in terms of when it started to when it finally ended. And so in the audit uh, that we just received two weeks ago, <coughs> and really in the financial statements preparing for that, Ruth and Kate uh, were able to understand really kind of where we ended up. Um, and it shows itself exactly in that audit. And so through a variety of sources, which includes bid premium from all three bond issues related to this borrowing, um, the fact that the project came in under budget, uh, we had interest earnings along the way, and there's also other fundraising activities, brick sales, and I'm not sure what else. But all told, we've got about $2.6 million in money. And so with that knowledge, we've consulted several times with Bond Council in terms of what is our flexibility and also what are our requirements. Uh, these monies are regulated through the Internal Revenue Service, and they have very particular uh, requirements. And we, first and foremost, need to uh, respect those. And so. What I'm proposing here really is the best and I think perhaps the only way to accomplish kind of two goals which are somewhat mutually exclusive. The first of which is to make sure we comply with all related regulatory requirements. And the second is to, at the same time, uh, allow as much flexibility for us to kind of make this transition. So really the upshot is from the Bond Council is these monies are limited. They must be used for the uh, authorized purpose, so they must be used toward wet work debt. Uh, and two, her advice is that we, to make sure we respect IRS rules, that we spend it as quick as, as we can. And so what I've handed to you is a proposal that would have us spending about a million dollars of the, that money in the current fiscal year. Now these are debt service payments that are budgeted for, um, but really to follow advice of counsel is to spend it on qualified reasons, debt, and to do so in the current fiscal year, and then to spend the, ba the balance of that against wet work debt for fiscal year 17. And so what that does in effect is it will produce essentially a million dollar surplus at the end of this fiscal year 16 uh, because we're using these other funds other than that was budgeted. And it being fund balance, it's then far more flexible in terms of when and how you choose to use it. Um, I suggest that we keep this money, be mindful of it, and use it to help in this transition because I think it's going to be necessary. Uh, and then in fiscal year 17, uh, we use the remainder, which is about 1.5657, 
which doesn't call, cover all Wentworth costs, but it certainly plugs the million dollar hole that we're seeing from the state. And I guess the cautionary note is that I want to make sure that we're not doing this just for expedience or convenience. Uh, we've got a, there is a, a cliff in front of us and we ought to be mindful of that. We're just, in some sense, pushing it off. Uh, but I think we can use these monies to help step it down uh, easier over time. So um, that's, that's, in a nutshell, basically what I'll be uh, representing in the budget. And um, I don't know if staff has anything to add further. <coughs> I think you did a good ex provided a good explanation, Tom. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So in terms of how we use that going forward, I think that's a fascinating conversation, but we really need to know what the landscape is in terms of what, what the next biennial budget means for education and where we fit into that, what our valuation, our student population, all those things will be better known you know, at the time. The, the good news is we'll have some flexibility and some money to, to fall back to or to put into play to help transition down. Personally, I think this is a uh, band-aid to a bigger problem, but it's nice to have that band-aid right now because really what it comes down to, I think, is um, matters of policy and how we then play out the budget for the whole year, but then also going forward because we can't view this as an, um, um, what's the word? Not an opportunity. We can't view this as uh, a windfall by any stretch of the imagination because we don't know when is that cliff going to hit us from the state? Mm -hmm. And this gives us, the, this is like bridge financing. It's, it's a gap to get us between where we are today and what we know to be inevitable from the state. So this is a great plan at, a, at an opportunity or at a time that uh, seems to have uh, been on our benefit at least. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would have preferred, and I pushed as hard as I could with bond counsel at the end, what she says, rules. Mm -hmm. I would have preferred using more in the current year and then having more available in the out years. Uh, but really, she insisted, appropriately so, that we need to respect the IRS rules and, and this is a, a, a plan and a program that she's endorsed and recommended to us. So that's, that's why we bring it to you. I, I guess I think I look at it as, um, you know, to your point, Tom, we're, I look at the analogy I, I was thinking of the other day was it's an airplane. We, we <coughs> land before we can refuel and take off again. And the question is, is how quickly do we land? If we land too quickly, we crash. If we, this gives us a little bit more fuel and a little more, more time to do a safe controlled landing, if you will, and, and keep it stable and predictable. This isn't the only mechanism we have. We have a couple of other mechanisms we'll be, I'm sure we'll be discussing on how we get to that point. But the, I think the discussion really should be um, I, I think we're all in agreement. It's not whether we get on the ground or not. It's it's how long it takes us to get there. And I think maybe once we get there, then the discussion shifts more appropriately to how quickly do we want to take off again and how steep do we want that takeoff to be. But we got to land first. And, and I think for the public, just to, so they understand, we sort of live this world of, of minimum receiver. That's what you're referring to when you Correct. talk about Correct. landing. It's, yes. it's becoming a minimum receiver from the state. Correct. And well, the only advantage of that is it removes volatility. I mean, the right. bad news is we get less, but at least we're, we know where we stand, and we don't have these, well, there's never been climbs. It's always been yeah, right. steps down. We, we flatline, so to speak. Not to continue the analogy of landing, because they actually do refuel in the air now. <laughs> not commercial plane, Sean. I don't know where you fly with it. I've been watching the plane in the air now in Air Force One. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um, no, I mean, but it's a good analogy because this doesn't necessarily require, this is a gap that doesn't necessarily require us to land because if we start planning now that we're going to be minimal receiver, this is the gap that allows us to start planning for it today. You know, and I agree with everything that's been said. I think also it's an opportunity to continue the work sort of this group mm -hmm. going forward because we've had Huge. now, you know, the, the capital plan for the municipal sides come forward. There's going to be a capital plan, so it's it's a real good time because there is going to be a cliff that that once these monies run out, then there's going to be a much bigger share that needs to come from the tax base. So I think it, it'd be great to use this time also to really think about all of those things we have coming down the pike, and do some strategic planning about yeah how we're going to plan for that landing so right. it's a smooth landing right um, 
and, and so it, I think that involves, but I think it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of sort of a group like this or a different group to really start coming together to do it. So I'd, I'd love to see that after, once we get through the budget process yes. to yeah. really start thinking about what that is and how we have to restructure and what we need to do. And those realities will affect, I suspect, a conversation around what sort of investments, how much and where can we yeah. make in education right. and in, on the town side. Yeah. And it may have to be tempered a bit during the transition. Right. And then another conversation or at the same time when we can really pick well, back up and make those further investments. This leads into the greater importance around our um, fund balance policies. Because we're creating a million dollars, this year we're creating a million dollar surplus, so it's going to be dedicated to education. But then it talks about, you know, then we have to take into consideration if we exceed the 3% that's maximum allowed by the state, um, what happens and how do we plan. Because the way I personally way, way I view this, we should never run out of the money because this is creating, at least until 2018, it's creating a surplus situation if we budget properly. I think, too, what it does is it's begins to get us, as, as the, the leaders of the town, to be looking at more than just a one-year budget. That's right. We're right. now having to look. Three years. Of what's, coming. Com what's coming. This was yeah. what, two years? Right. And, and I think it kind of builds on the conversation we've had about trying to find a way that we can get some stabilization to, yeah. our, to our mill rate. Mm -hmm. Right. And what does that do, and what's the timing, and how do we put all these pieces together so we can, we can string that forward? Because I think that's going to be really important. So. This is good news. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the meeting recap. Do we have any takeaways? Ruth is usually good at our takeaways. Do we have any takeaways today? Anyone uh, finish have the, finish? Oh, yes. yes. Finish the glossary of terms. Finish the, yeah. so, so I have a take, two takeaways. Back. I know. <laughs> I'm okay with whatever terms you want to put in there. So if you want to put no, the no, entire no, you, you have to you write the have definition. Some that you have to define the rest of this. Find Whatever you want. No, uh, so I have a couple of questions to ask as part of the takeaways. So first is because um, it's kind of a low point if you think about it. Because now we're waiting until April 6th, and which we didn't. At least I am. What you're talking about? Low. <laughs> it's a low. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right. There's no low. It's a low for us, but not for these two gentlemen it's and their a staff. Low on a frenzy. That's right. Um, so April 6th, we get the budget. Uh, my bigger question is, um, and not to. Um, for lack of better words, diminish the presentation that was given. I am nowhere any closer to understanding what metrics do we select um, to be able to know whether or not the school department and the school's budget is what we need. I, so I would like to ask, as part of the budget, and, and, that, and this can wait until whenever, the school department usually gives us, um, we have a one-on-one -on -one with the finance committee on the town's finance. If I could, if I, I'd like to see a recommendation on what that metric is, or um, if it's a group of three, whatever it might be, and then why, and how this budget helps us understand that we're achieving something. Whether it's per pupil cost, whether it's one of the, uh, you know, is he gonna present? Yes. whichever yes. one that you guys decide. I personally, I would just like that recommendation because I'm not any closer to knowing. Well, I think I think what the, for me what this presentation did was. She, Exactly that it showed you you can't just look at okay. What's the per people spending? This is how we're gonna measure our success or okay. What's the results of? Testing okay, that's how we're gonna measure I think it showed that it's more in depth and a little more complex than just sort of throwing out a sound bite And there's probably a two or three year lag right by the time we make the investments yeah. it's right. the outcomes before you start to see the outcomes yeah. and, even said that, yeah. and with the change in the testing over the last year and now this year again we just threw out a whole year we just kind of right. but what are we going to compare yes. that to because there is no subsequent year of right. testing for that matching test I think so what to speak i believe sean is getting to and i fully subscribe to this as opposed to simply throwing money at it saying we need to spend more per pupil, I think the argument, what we're, not the argument, what we're looking for is we need to be able to, to really demonstrate and talk about these are the strategic the investments, this is why, these are the metrics we're going to use to measure ourselves. Well, we have a 24-month plan that people should take a look at because that pretty much identifies all of the metrics and where the investments are to be made. And, um, and I'm pleased to report that uh, you know, we're 12 months through it and we are making extraordinary progress. I, I, I mean, I don't know if people want to 
sit through a two-hour presentation of the planning that we've done over the course of the last several years where we have laid out very specific targets and very specifically tied those targets to our investments. And, and, uh, and again, do, is there a direct co correlation? I like that word because correlation is like one of the most purest connections. Mm -hmm. No, there's not. I mean, it's just, it's just very difficult to do that. But in terms of looking at what have we committed to doing, what have we done, um, we, you know, we can go through that. But I think that that for the school organization is is great. Um, but I think the entire town should do that. Right. Quite frankly, I, I mean, you know, I, I think that in terms of facilities planning, in terms of strategic planning, in terms of reporting out to the board, in terms of monitoring very closely what kind of progress we're making, in terms of looking at the investments that we've made. We've got it all. I mean, uh, you know, hopefully the narrative change in our budget will, you know, uh, Kate very dramatically shows, the, you know, the budget and, and the town budget and, and Tom and his team have done a great job of really laying things out. We have laid all of that same stuff out in separate planning documents and never really incorporated it because we're sort of restricted to this fo ugly, format of numbers that nobody really wants to look at and and scarily met few people know how to read um, and so I think moving in that same direction we're not we're not uh, creating that now we're just taking from our documents in terms of the planning that has been ongoing since 2011 and really taking that verbiage and that narrative and putting it into the budget. So I think that that will help people better understand it. But I don't know necessarily that there is any lack of, you know, planning, any lack of monitoring of planning or or any lack of looking at our investments or tying our investments to our targeted improvements and looking at the results of, of the efforts. And I don't want to, um, by my question, I didn't want to come across, and I apologize if I did, that you haven't done that already. Mm -hmm. The question is, how do you synthesize all of that information into what is the most important metrics for the community to look at, at the very least for the town council to look at, and say this budget is achieving that goal? Well, um, I think that, so I think that, that narrative, I think that the narrative that we've now incorporated uh, Kate has done a, a great job of getting us all started. She and I okay. are now the chief editors on that. I think that it, it, it will read as a story, and there's, I mean, there's not just a few metrics, there's a bunch of metrics in there. Right. Okay. Okay. So I guess, yeah. and I guess my question back is, are other departments or other town units also having to submit that? So the finance committee on the town side has as its next item is to talk about what are the metrics that we want to measure municipal services at, whether it's a financial accounting metrics or um, meaning that you, you know, whether not to get, whether it's current ratio, working capital, whatever it might be, we're going to have that conversation. The, the but the other departments are not being asked, you know, so we're not asking public safety and, um, uh, you know, public works versus public safety having their own metrics. The finance committee is, is looking at what are the metrics that we're going to kind of measure the other services at. We're certainly not opposed to that. I think it's a fair, very fair point. The problem is it's a data, uh, it's a data problem. Um, we don't have the, we don't have a we comparison can, group that you guys have. You know, and, and there's no source of that. So, so because there's available data versus not available data, one is being held to one standard no, 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 and the no, other no. is being held to another? No. Just, I mean, I'm so just let's not get defensive here. Okay. So I'm going to be, let's not get defensive. What we're saying is that we have, we have a different, measure to set that metrics to. You have a comparative group that is more <coughs> fruitful and more um, informing than the group that we have. We're going to use our financial statements to determine what is the metrics that we want to measure the town. And by the way, as a department of the town, it would be inclusive of that metrics. So when we sit there and talk about working capital um, or a debt to capital kind of ratio, then it would include the school department no differently than public safety or any other department. What I'm saying is that when you're asking for the amount of money that we asked for from the, uh, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm, now, I'm now feeling like I'm getting defensive. Um, we're just sitting like, trying to explain the budget request that's being asked for. And what is the, what is the best ratio? Is it per people? Is it? Right. I, I think, again, maybe, maybe to just shed, <coughs> save it. This is my own, <laughs> my own personal take is, 
Um, yes, every department and every investment at this in from, I mean, we're all one budget now, right? So we're not doing, I, I'd be very cautious to say that, that from my personal perspective as a finance chair or a finance member, I'm not going to be evaluating the school's request for budget proposal with any different light than the, the uh, public safety or, or public works in that I would expect whomever comes in front of the finance committee and requests resources and allocation will have a good justification for that. And the questions that will be asked, I'm hoping, will be fairly uniform across the board of why is this needed, what, is the, you know, what, what are the purposes behind it, what can we expect for outcomes, and, and is this a, sh a short-term gain, a long-term gain? Does this, you know, the, the, the typical questions that we would ask for anything. I think the, the, the challenge here is I'm, I, I know those metrics do exist. It's always projecting out to the rest of the community of, you know, what, what are we hoping to achieve? I mean, to me, obviously, the purpose of education isn't spreadsheet management. It's not bond management. It's educating children. So let's look at where our performance factors are, and let's look at what are some realistic, and, uh, some, some realistic expectations for those improvements. And then we can back out the investment in terms of amount and time. Likewise, on the municipal side, if we're looking at hiring more personnel for a particular department, the question is, what are we looking at improving? Is it response time? Is it efficiency? Is it coverage? What is it that's causing this request for investment? And then we have to sit down and evaluate, is that the priority that we have with limited resources? I mean, let's face it, if it, we had the cash to do all this stuff, it, wouldn't, you know, it would be great. We could just say yes to everything, but we clearly don't. But we've got to have a, a, some, some tangible way of prioritizing the investments of the town. And this is a great process to help us understand from the council side the methodology and the mindset that, that the school board is using to come up with those numbers. I think what we're just asking for is some way for us to be able to communicate that in the simplest terms with the fewest variables possible in a simple way so that when we all go out at budget time and say this is the right budget, this is why. And then we can all have that common language out there and not have to get into the you know, plethora of macroeconomics and micro and which, which part are we putting and why and that kind of stuff. But we do have to have a good narrative to take that out into the public and get support for the budget, I think. Yeah. There's a, two questions you said. Was only one. Um, I was entranced by uh, entranced by uh, Chris's comments, and I forgot the first, second question. <laughs> yes, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say on this. Kind of falling asleep, but finally on this point, for me, the reason that I think this conversation is important, and in the in the spirit of the cooperation that I think this group has used last year and carried on, and even stronger this year, is that you know this sort of data today tells a really important message. I mean, it validates some of the things we've been doing. And I think that's only going to make this process uh, more fruitful and perhaps easier in the future is if we can actually point and have data to support the sorts of things that you have been doing that you want to do in the future. I think that's a pretty important part I of think the, the data. Has yeah, been, I think the data has been there all along. It's basically been shared. Um, I, I do agree with you that um, you know, right now we have a comparison group. It's essentially the same comparison group that we identified uh, without all of this research, but now we have one that is research-based, so that's really great. So how do we compare to our comparison uh, groups, our cohort, how, do we, how have we spent, how has that impacted our ability to actually make the kind of moves that we want to move, move to now in terms of, um, I, I think that, that that's, ri that's right there. In terms of investments in education, how have, you know, how has Scarborough invested um, versus that comparative group ver versus that aspirational group? Again, all of that has been presented. Every, every year that I've been here, we've looked at that. Um, in terms of the state contribution to education, Kate has, Kate has memorized what that chart looks like as the subsidy continues to fall and fall and fall and the impact locally. I do think that this is, this is good. I guess I'm a little bristly uh, because um, we're talking about metrics and I thought we just confirmed what the metrics really are here. I don't know what, what else there would be other than getting into the very specifics of 
we set out to um, implement a, a pilot on a brand new performance evaluation system. Did you do it? Yes, we did. Boom, check. And you can go through the rest of the plan and, and do the same thing. I, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I'm into metrics as much as anyone else, but I don't know that there's anything simple that tells any different a story than the metrics that we have used in, 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 uh, in presenting the budget. Is there, I, I do think that the move to doing a, a narrative budget and really yeah. pulling all of that out, I think gives us an opportunity um, and, and uh, darn that we didn't think about it sooner because um, it, while, it's, while it would ordinarily be a lot of work and it is in terms of formatting, there's nothing that we haven't had to be able to back up what we've been doing that we've created, especially for this budget. Right. That's what I'm saying. We, we, hey, all of it's there. We just need to communicate Correct. it differently. And right. Perhaps and, the budget and documents I do exactly that. I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, I think, and for me, I, you know, what I thought about is, you know, we've heard a lot about being more transparent as a group. And it's sort of, I mean, in today's world, it's sort of the USA Today sound bites. But, but our goal was to try to pass the budget on the first time. So. How, what are some things that we can communicate clearly to our all the community about the things we're trying to achieve with, and then have some type of way we can measure what we say we're going to do? I think that was the intent of trying to find some metrics, whether it's how much debt, whatever we want to pick. But I think it kind of builds on what we talked about. There are several simple things that's easy to communicate clearly to folks that this is what we're trying to do, this is what we're going to be held accountable to, Take the journey with us. I mean, that's that's where we're trying to get mm -hmm. to. Because the problem becomes, I think you've had all those metrics, but boy, the dialogue last year, it, people sure got confused. <laughs> you but know, the, but the simple takeaway for me is that we put money in the classroom, and we showed improvements in the where we needed it the most. Mm -hmm. Monique that's, comes in presents that to us almost annually. Yeah. Every oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, right, we, but, yeah, but the, the, that's way, exactly. Right. That's, 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 the, that's the so, challenge. And so. I think that's why when he used the term bristly, is that what you used? Mm -hmm. I think I think we're all sort of feeling that way, in that we've been saying it for years, and just it, and now it just has been said by someone else, and hopefully that penetra penetrates through to. Right. So the, the positive is is getting that pull through now. That even though you've been yeah. saying it for years, mm -hmm. now we have the opportunity to pull that message out and really really get it out there collaboratively and collectively and that's really the key and and I, I, I maybe some of the concern would be that if you pick one or two of these things that that's the only thing that's going to be the measurement tool I don't necessarily I don't see that it's too complex of an issue but it does need to be presented in, in as simple a form as possible meaning that I mean ultimately our, like I said our goal is outcomes it's, it's educational performance right so if we can't use the test data what's the what do you what, what, what measurement or what metric can we use in the interim that, that I mean, ultimately all of these investments are, are for one common goal, and that's improvement in education. How do we measure that improvement? What do we look at? It, we don't need the, the PhD dissertation of all the factors that go into it, but we do need a good, to Peter's point, a couple of good sound bites that says, hey, you know, this investment, look at the history here. That's what this document is great. We've been doing this steadily. What's the, what's, the, what's the reason for keeping it going? In, in, and why do we do this instead of something else? That's where the compelling argument needs to come. And, and that's why I think there's a great opportunity for us to collectively come up with that compelling argument to say th that investment, what little we can invest, needs to go here, and this is why, because of all of these things behind it. So yes, we've been, it's been said for years and years and years. It's a different scenario now. It's a different environment now. And I think we can capitalize on this, uh, on this joint collaborative effort and put that foot together collectively together and say, we've worked on this, guys, the, you know, for the community. We've been working on this for months and months and months. We've all filtered through this stuff. Not everybody's going to like it, but it's a logical, realistic approach, and there is a, a, a reasoning behind it. And I think that's what we've got to communicate. And I think that's what maybe that's where the the, 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 the the discussion should center around of yeah, there's multiple other ones out there, but what are the what are the real key messages we want to push forward with this budget? Both not just from the school side, but from the municipal side too. Because if it comes down to it and we we have very little to invest, but the fire department makes a compelling argument that if we don't have, you know, new employees for whatever reason our response times go down, we have to look at that and say, okay. Maybe that's a higher priority right now than, than 
fully funding or fully giving the investments for education. That's the, we've got to have some logical way of determining that between, the, between all the departments. And I think this would be a huge help doing it this way. I'd be curious to know what people thought was the most significant things that they took away from this. When George and I had a good little discussion as well as with the people as they were leaving, that, that our, our test performance on uh, proficiency at the third and fifth and eighth grades is, is remarkable. I mean, there's obviously, uh, and George was saying that, uh, that putting uh, more educational emphasis in the high school would be a, and I didn't know that before I came here today. And that that, that, that sort of, uh, did, I, did I think we didn't spend too much? Yeah, from what I had looked at before for per pupil costs, I didn't, this told me we don't, we're not overly spending. We're a community that is actually, in some respects, I thought underspending compared to cohort schools with uh, towns with equal uh, uh, amounts of per capita income uh, uh, assessed values. So that didn't come as a surprise. But the, the, the way the, school, the scores dropped from 8th grade to 11th grade mm -hmm. really surprised me. Two or three towns out of the whole 20 that were being compared, they maintained that consistency throughout. The other 15 all dropped significantly from 8th to 11th grade. You said, why? What's going on? And so you had mentioned earlier that uh, the ratio of per pupil to, st uh, to teacher at the high school is one of the reasons why, when you look at US News and World Report, ranks us lower. Because we're 1 to 15, and the other schools are all 1 to 12. <coughs> so uh, uh, at some point, you start to say, well, and, and you said, you've been analyzing, have plans, and and the ability to, well, it would help the school, the town council to understand these things because they're in the unique position of having to make a judgment on the total amount of your budget without a hell of a lot of knowledge about the details of what you're planning. And, and we always say to each other, well, that's not our responsibility. How you spend your money is your responsibility. But how do you make a decision as to how much without having a good sense of all that went into it and where you're putting money to reinforce uh, areas that need to be strengthened. So the more we can educate the town council on this, I think the better. Do we go through the kind of lengthy analyses and meetings you have? No. But, uh, but there's got to be a process that gives them something of the executive summary of where we're going as a school system and as a town that, that allows them to be more informed than they are now. I think you can accomplish that two ways. You can accomplish that with, uh, you know, in the budget um, uh, narrative, or we can accomplish that in the finance committees when you sit down with the budget and we start asking questions. Um, I, I think it's more productive to, to maybe do a combination of the two, but um, I'm hoping this, that's what this forum does. I agree with you. This I forum think, gives us a little the, the The front of our <clears throat> efforts to understand it is our finance committee, we're, the two finance committees working together to understand it. And then that information can get disseminated from the town finance committee members to the rest of the town council. And to, I think to be ultimately successful, we need to disseminate it to the, to the populace. And that's the piece where I think we've struggled. So if there's a way we can boil us down to a couple of those two or three sound bites or takeaways, we now have a statistically valid you know, document prepared by academic professionals. I don't think anyone can question the veracity of the data and what it is. Um, we now need to tell a story in, in kind of bite-sized pieces, understandable pieces. Yes. Okay. Moving on. Um, uh, one question. I, I, I heard this question about um, just kind of dovetailing on Patron, at some point are we going to schedule time to kind of, how do we, we need to work on a communication plan at some point, so just as a future agenda item, <coughs> where we should park that about what is the story we're going to tell. I mean, that's, 
Well, I think we need a budget first, so we well, don't I know, I know. It's, 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 it's happening yeah. fast, but, it I, but I'm thinking right. this group needs to then, once we get closer, right. but I think we need to start thinking about how we spin that story. Every what month. is the story we want to tell so we can go to the public to get Every them? Every week. Yep. I made a note we'll include that somehow as a future topic. Yep. Uh, public input? <coughs> no. Adjournment. So I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Mm -hmm. Leader. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, if I can get those three.